What's up guys, welcome to the Chess Giant. This is Solomon Ordell, and in today's video, we cover one of the craziest and honestly interesting chess openings I've ever seen in my entire life, the Steinitz Gambit. Many of you have probably heard of Wilhelm Steinitz, the former world chess champion who has had an amazing impact on the game of chess as a whole. And in today's video, we cover his pet opening, which he popularized. One of the ways to reach this is actually through the Vienna game. We as white play e4, and against e5, we could play the move knight f3 at attacking that pawn, but with the Vienna game, we now have knight c3. By developing this minor piece, we're not looking to make a threat, obviously, against e5, or really any threat at all, but instead gain control of the light squares in the center of the board, specifically d5 and e4, as well as just naturally develop our pieces. One of the main options for black is knight c6, kind of copying our setup here, looking to control e5 and d4. And against this move, white has a very interesting option with f4, a king's gambit type move, attacking the pawn on e5 and allowing black to take the pawn. And if black goes into the accepted variation, we now can play d4, an even crazier move, now entering the Steinitz gambit allowing black to actually play queen h4 check attacking our king on e1 but as steinitz always said the king is an attacking piece and we're now going to play king e2 at move five in the game what on earth is going on we just gave up a pawn we just allowed black to play queen h4 check we just played king e2 at move five in the game why on earth would we ever do this? Well, I actually think that this is a very interesting and very aggressive chess opening for white. By playing f4 and allowing black to take that pawn, we have gained ourselves a very nice center with e4 and d4, and we're going to continue by soon playing knight f3, really looking to gain a tempo on the queen on h4, and soon take the pawn on f4 with a tempo. On top of that, we always have knight d5 ideas attacking that pawn on c7. And here against the Steinitz Gambit, at the master and grandmaster level, there's really two moves that black plays here most of the time. The most popular option is d6, looking to bring the bishop to g4 check, attacking the king. And the second most popular option is b6, looking to bring this bishop to a6, attacking our king on e2. In today's video, we're going to cover both of these moves. And really the main idea behind both of these is getting this light squared bishop involved. If black plays passive moves here, we're simply going to play knight f3, soon take the pawn on f4, continue with knight d5, knight takes c7, white is going to have a completely one game. So black cannot waste any time in attacking our king. So let's first go over the move d6. Against d6, we're going to play knight f3, attacking that queen on h4. And the best move for black is bishop g4, pinning that knight, in which case we're now going to play bishop takes f4 with tempo. And I know some of you are probably wondering why on earth would we ever take this pawn, at least when I first went over the Steinitz gambit. I was wondering why master and grandmaster level players would ever go with bishop takes f4 because of bishop takes f3 check. Now, if we take with g takes f3, which by the way, I don't think that's white's best move, black can now take on f4. And this is actually okay for white. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that taking with the pawn is a terrible move because after queen takes f4, we now have knight d5 attacking the queen and attacking c7, in which case we're going to be forking the king and the rook here black would much rather get forked than lose the queen so if black plays a move like queen h4 we can now play knight takes c7 check and following king d7 continue with knight takes a8 and it appears at least for a second that white is clearly winning this game because we're currently up three points of material but this knight on a8 is actually trapped it can't come to c7 without being captured and it can't come to b6 without being captured here black can simply play king c8 followed by king b8 attacking our knight in the corner of the board. I think our best move is probably knight b6, forcing black to get double isolated pawns. But in this position, I actually don't really like white's game personally. We don't really have any development at all. We have a king right in the center of the board, and I would definitely give the edge to black. As I mentioned earlier, I don't think that G takes F3 is white's best option. Some of you may be wondering what on earth is Solomon about to say? This guy is crazy maybe a little bit. King takes f3, I believe, is white's best move. This is kind of the whole idea 
behind the Steinitz Gambit, using our king as an attacking piece. And actually in this position, I would give the edge to white. Whenever I plug this into a computer program, it gives a slight advantage to white. And here black has a very interesting decision to make, and that's how to attack the king on f3. I would first start off by saying that g5 is probably black's best option, in which case we can now play g3, attacking the queen on h4. Idea being if queen h5 check, we now have g4, again using our king to defend the pawn on g4, attacking the queen on h5. And if queen g6, we can now play bishop e3. Black's best option is h5, in which we now play bishop d3, really looking to gain vision on that queen, currently looking at e5 ideas, breaking this game open. And if h takes g4 is played, we're not going to take that pawn on g4. The king has officially decided to stop attacking black and will now play king e2 going back if a move like bishop g7 with both of these minor pieces attacking our centralized pawn. I actually think that white is completely fine after the move queen g1. We're currently down a pawn, but we're defending this pawn on d4 with both our bishop and our queen. We're attacking this pawn on g4, and it's kind of hard for black to defend it. Black's best option might just be g3, allowing us to play h3 and then later taking that pawn back. If a move like queen h5, we simply play king d2 and black's attacking chances are diminishing while we still have a very strong center in the center of the board with knight d5 ideas. We can soon swing our rook to f1 and I like white's game there. And if a move like knight f6 is played, which seems like a pretty good option, I mean just developing the knight naturally, defending that pawn, we now have e5, breaking this game open, attacking the knight, attacking the queen, and white is simply winning this game here. So as I mentioned, I think that g5 is black's best option, immediately attacking the bishop and trying to go after our king all the way on f3, and I would put that position around equal, but honestly, if black plays any other move, I would give the clear edge to white. Let's say black plays a move like knight f6. The whole idea here is that just like before, we're going to play g3 and following a move like queen h5, fianchetto our king on g2. And honestly, now our king is very safe on the g2 square. If a move like queen takes d1, we're going to centralize our rook defending the pawn on d4, continue with bishop b5 pinning that knight on c6. And I absolutely love white's game there. And if a move like queen g6 is played, trying to keep attacking chances alive, we can now play bishop d3. Again, a key idea, threatening to play e5. Black's best option is knight b4 attacking that bishop on d3, in which case we can now just play a move like rook e1, take our bishop on d3, and if a move like castle and queen side continue with a4, gaining space on the queen side with a5 and a6 ideas, honestly I would give a clear edge to white. We have a very nice center, an advantage in development, and just overall activity of the pieces. I think that any Steinitz Gambit player would be happy in this position. So that covers the move d6, in which we're going to play knight f3, and in the case of bishop g4, take that pawn on f4, take back with our king, look to fianchetto our king on g2, and I think that white is completely fine there. What about the second most popular option at the master and grandmaster level for black after d6, b6? And when I first saw this move, I was a little bit confused. I'm like, why would black ever want to bring the bishop to b7 and castle queenside? Wouldn't black want to aggressively attack our king on e2? But the whole idea of b6 is not to fianchetto the bishop, but bring the bishop to a6, attacking our king on e2. In this position, you need to play the move queen d2, which really does two things. Now both the queen and the bishop are attacking that pawn on f4, but more importantly, it gives this king an escape square on d1. Following the move bishop a6 check, we actually can't move our king to either e1 or f2, defending the bishop on f1, because this queen on h4 slices down right on those two squares. So here we play king d1. And many of you are probably wondering, wait, aren't we just giving up a full piece? Why do we keep giving up pieces in this opening? Well, we get the piece right back with knight f3 attacking the queen. There's no way for this queen to defend the bishop on f1. And the very next move, we're simply going to take that bishop back. 
Here, if black plays a move like g5, I like the key idea of knight d5, centralizing our knight, currently threatening knight takes c7, and on top of that, if g4 is ever played, we now have knight takes f4, attacking the queen on h5. Previously, black wanted to play g4 and aggressively attack our king, but now because of knight d5, this is no longer an option. We have vision on that pawn on f4, and this position was actually reached by a master level player by the name of J. Jaroslav Palasek with the white pieces. Here he had an amazing game, so I thought we could go over it. Here black played the move, castling queenside, stopping the threat of knight takes c7, in which Palasek now played a4, advancing on the queen side of the board, and after a5, stopping white from breaking through the move queen e2. Queen e2 does two things. First off, queen a6 check ideas are in the air, and more importantly, knight takes g5 ideas are in the air because if queen takes g5 we could take the pawn on f4 with our bishop attack the queen and then take that pawn on c7 giving up a piece getting three to four pawns in return and soon checkmating the king on c8 so here black played h6 simply looking to calm this position down getting rid of any knight takes g5 ideas because h takes g5 defending the queen with the rook on h8 and here white played bishop d2 this may seem kind of passive, but the whole idea was this move of b4, breaking the queen side open. Here black took the pawn on b4, in which white was now two pawns and said, hey, here is a third pawn. It's very good to notice that black actually can't take with the knight because of rook takes a5, an absolutely beautiful move. Idea being after b takes a5, we have queen b5 with check. We can continue by taking the pawn on a5, threatening checkmate on c7 and checkmate on a8. Here this game is simply resignable for black. So instead of taking that pawn on a5, black continued with rook a8, in which we now see knight take c7, absolutely ruthless attacking chess, taking that pawn, following the move king takes c7, we now have a takes b6 with check, attacking the rook on a8, so black decided to defend it with king b7, in which we now trade off, and following king takes b8, white is actually down three points immaterial down a full piece but white is simply winning after the moves queen a6 check followed by king e2 idea being getting this rook to a1 getting this rook in the action threatening queen a8 with mate black tried to play queen g6 threatening the pawn on e4 but honestly white didn't really care about the pawn on e4 but instead played rook a1 black continued with queen takes e4 but following king d1 black has a huge edge and material but black can't stop this queen a8 checkmate threat without giving up the square on a7 for example if a move like knight d8 is played sure we can't play queen a8 now but we can play queen a7 and following king c8 swing our queen over to c7 we have ourselves a game over coming out of the steinitz gambit if you guys would like to learn more behind the theory of the triple museo gambit an absolutely crazy attacking chess opening for white click the video to the left if you'd like to learn more about the ponziani opening in general click our playlist to the right leave a comment below to let me know what other chess openings you'd like to see covered on this channel and as always i appreciate you guys thanks for watching peace